Hello, welcome back once again to Talking Europe. I'm Catherine Nicholson, uh, joining you from the European Parliament with one of the Parliament's most outspoken members and one of the MEPs most closely involved in the Brexit process. A former Prime Minister of Belgium, Guy Verhofstadt, has been a member of the European Parliament since 2009, leading the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats group more recently heading up the EU Parliament's Brexit Steering Group. Uh, thank you very much, Guy Hofstadt, for being with us. It's a pleasure. Now, it's no surprise to you, I would like to start by talking about Brexit. Uh, there has been much talk recently about the no deal scenario. Uh, Michel Barnier, the European Union's chief negotiator, pouring scorn on the plan that's been agreed on by Theresa May and her government. Um, you met with the new UK Brexit minister, Dominic Raab, recently. What's your evaluation of where things stand? Are we stuck? Well, it's in fact a difficult moment uh, because uh, uh, we need to have an agreement normally within six weeks, mm. eight weeks uh, at the latest. And uh, uh, we can make certainly progress on a number of issues. Uh, or uh, common uh, cooperation in internal security, in external security, uh, in a more thematic uh, cooperation like uh, uh, research or Euratom. All this is possible. The, the main problem is uh, uh, how uh, we see the cooperation uh, on, on economics and on trade. And there, the, 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 I have to tell you that the Checkers Plan has a lot of positive uh, chapters and elements on, on internal security, external security, thematic cooperation. But it will not fly, I think, uh, on, uh, on, on, on trade and economics because it's pure uh, cherry picking uh, in, 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 uh, inside the European Union. Well, recently, uh, your deputy in the ALD group, Sophie Intfeld, told uh, British reporters that there is no such thing as a successful Brexit. Now, that's the kind of statement that can tend to be taken by people in the UK who advocate leaving um, as some kind of proof that European politicians just don't want there to be a positive outcome for the UK? No, it's not. <laughs> the European Union have pushed out the UK. It's the UK who have taken the, the, the autonomous decision uh, by referendum to go out. So that it, it, everything what is happening is the consequence of that choice. It is not a choice by the European Union because the choice of the European Union was a continuous membership of, uh, uh, of the UK. And, and unfortunately, that is not happening. So what, what we will not do is to, yeah, is to break down, is to uh, uh, destroy uh, the, the rules and the values of the European Union because of Brexit. You cannot expect from us because uh, Britain is going out that we're going to change everything in the European Union because of, of, of that. So what we really uh, hope is that there is a sense of reality uh, uh, coming in on the issue of uh, the economic and trade uh, uh, cooperation and, 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 and to uh, uh, to have a, yeah, on, on that uh, a sense of reality that is because the, the, the main the main victims of, of, of Brexit will be if there is no deal eh, if there is no deal uh, will be the uh, yeah, the the workers the labour force uh, the industry in, in in Britain. Some people wondering if perhaps there is more room for manoeuvre on the European side. However, uh, recently the IMF uh, predicted that a no deal scenario would cost the EU around 1.5% of its GDP. As many as a million jobs uh, could be lost within the other EU 27. Um, considering that and even kind more of at the British side. So it's Indeed. A, so the no deal is, there is more the room baddest. For on the, 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 side? the no deal is the is the bad, uh, the baddest uh, solution. But to avoid a no deal. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, yeah, uh, Britain uh, has to, to accept a, a, a number of, uh, of rules, or the, the, the normal rules, the normal values of the European Union. Again, you cannot expect that Britain says, OK, we go out of the European Union, and now the European Union has to change their rules so to give us a good deal. It, work, it, 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 doesn't, work like, uh, it doesn't work like that. I think, nevertheless, I'm, I'm still optimistic that at the end there can be uh, an agreement an agreement in, in, in which there is close economic cooperation uh, between the UK and, and, and the EU, uh, where there is uh, also uh, yeah, a customs uh, uh, arrangement, but it cannot be the customs arrangement that is in the Chequers Plan, for example. The Chequers so that plan, has to be changed from the Chequers Plan? Uh, the Chequers Plan, the, the customs arrangement is that there are going to be two different tariffs. And it's not a customs union when you have two different tariffs. Uh, for example, a UK one that is higher or lower than the European one. And then secondly, that uh, we're going to outsource 
uh, and they're gonna outsource their custom duties. That's that's not the customs union. A customs union needs to be the same tariff, the same standards, and and and, and one type of uh, of uh, customs uh, uh, duties. Uh, and, and the same is on the other uh, issue. Uh, sherry picking inside the single market is is not possible. The single market is is yeah is a, is a is something that is very solid with uh, uh, freedom of movement of labor, freedom of movement of capital, freedom of movement of goods and of services. And we will not undo that, say, yeah, 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 you can have this on, on goods, but not on, 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 the other, uh, on the other topics. On the issue of freedom of movement and citizens' rights, something that's been a very big issue for parliamentarians here at the EU Parliament, uh, there are indications already that EU citizens are not coming to the UK in as great number and also people already there are leaving or preparing to leave. Uh, we'll just watch a report together that's been prepared by Catherine Norris-Trent and Jean Barrère. They've been looking at how this is hitting uh, the health sector. Like many in the UK, Kingston Hospital is battling to stay in good health with European doctors, nurses and other medics fearful of the post-Brexit future. French paediatrician Pascal only recently obtained a British passport. Her first application for residency was rejected. She ended up paying £2,000 in legal fees to be sure of staying in the UK. I think what I had to go through is unacceptable. We should never have to be put in this position. We have really been used as bargaining chips, and that's still going on. Everyone says the problems will be sorted out and we'll get a solution, but we've not had one yet. We still don't know much, and we can't make any future plans. According to the British Medical Association, 45% of European doctors are considering leaving. Here at Kingston Hospital, we're told, staff turnover has doubled in the past six months. We're filling the sink, but the plug is out, because we're actually very successful at recruiting people in, but we're struggling to keep those people. Previously, we had a good supply line uh, from EU staff. At the moment, that's, that's fallen away to a trickle, because those people are feeling very insecure about the future. So it's created a, 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 a major recruitment issue for us. Alaya, a nurse, has taken the plunge, faced with mounting europhobia among her patients. I was asked a lot more often, where are you from then? Um, it culminated on one day, one of my patients telling me to learn to speak English properly. They told me that, that if I didn't like it and that I could always leave and go back home. As the months have gone on, I really disliked what um, this country has turned into and I just don't feel welcome or valued anymore. So uh, in order to preserve my self-worth and my mental health, I just have to walk away. Since Brexit, the number of EU nurses registering to work in Britain has dropped by 96%. And with many leaving, that could put the UK's health service into a critical condition. So with uh, so much uncertainty on uh, the citizens' rights issue, uh, there's a campaign group called The Three Million that's yep. been talking about this a lot recently. Uh, they're saying that they really want citizens' rights, UK citizens in the EU and vice versa, to be guaranteed now. Theresa May has said in the past, nothing's agreed until everything is agreed. Uh, do you back their demand? Uh, Dominic Krapp was uh, also of the opinion, and uh, what is also my opinion, that we have to secure in any way the, the, the rights of citizens. And uh, we are not only talking about the European citizens living uh, in Britain, but also mm. about the UK uh, nationals living on the continent. Uh, so more, more than uh, one and a half million, mainly in, in countries like uh, Spain, uh, uh, Germany and, and France. Are there problems? Yeah, there are still problems. Uh, mainly problems of, not on principles, but the implementation of these rights in practice is still a, a problem. People have to pay a fee. It's still not certain if they can do an application for these citizens' rights uh, based on one formula for a family. So they need to fill in uh, different uh, formulas. Mm -hmm. Then how people who, uh, are have not the skills uh, to do it on internet mm -hmm. uh, with their iPhone or with their iPad, uh, how we can help them. So there are still a, a lot of outstanding problems and I hope that we can reach with the European Parliament an agreement on this with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Home Office Secretary. So agreement in principle about securing citizens' it's rights, done. but uh, members of this campaign group saying that the timing is a big issue for them because of course they want to know if they're going to be facing immediate problems at the moment of Brexit, or can they be given some kind of legal assurance now? Now, that's the point. We want that there is a, a clarity in all the implementation of the citizens' rights before mm -hmm. 
uh, the withdrawal agreement is approved by Parliament. Parliament will never approve this uh, withdrawal agreement if there is no 100% certainty uh, that there is a smooth uh, procedure uh, for uh, the citizens' rights uh, and, and that there is also uh, uh, a solution for the UK uh, nationals living on the continent because every of the individual member states have to assure that there is a, a procedure that is simple for these UK nationals. All right, we're looking away from Brexit somewhat to the future of Europe. You're oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes. <laughs> well, you're a strong and long-standing advocate of a more federal Europe. Yeah. That's well known. Um, in your, your book that you published last year, yeah. Europe's Last Chance, you said about how the Paris attacks uh, inspired a need for greater urgency on this issue over security cooperation, for example. Um, obviously, there has been a reduction in the number of attacks uh, over the last year or so. Uh, security, where do we stand in Europe? Because a lot of the Eurosceptics would say coming out of the EU structures, coming out of Schengen, would actually make Europeans more safe. Oh, it, it should make the, the things worse. Uh, if, if we do that. The, the, the problem is a, a lack of European cooperation. Look, in the fight against terrorism, there is no, what I call, European FBI to tackle terrorism. It's still a cooperation, a loose cooperation between uh, national uh, uh, authorities. And, and, and we have seen in every terrorist attack that uh, some national authorities, authorities had some information, but its information was not sent, shared, transferred uh, to the country where uh, the, uh, the terrorist attacks uh, happened. And the, the same is for, for European defence. We, 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 we are the European defence expenditure in Europe are three times bigger than in Russia. But I am not sure that we are capable to match the, the Russian army. Mm. Why? Because it are 28 different uh, uh, budgets and we duplicate 28 uh, times the same uh, uh, military expenditures. So, in the, well, and so, on. so that's only two examples. I could continue uh, uh, for hours to, uh, to, to, to show that only uh, Europe uh, can, uh, can, uh, can be the way forward. Well, related to those security concerns, we have of course seen uh, major protests in the German city of Chemnitz recently after uh, the st fatal stabbings there, um, which is presumed at this point to have been carried out by uh, asylum seekers. Uh, people there very worried about that European aspect to this crime story, whether membership of the European Union doesn't add that extra level yeah, of danger. The, 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 the problem there is also a lack of uh, a European Union. Uh, why there is a, a migration crisis, why there is a refugee crisis uh, in Europe. Not because of the, of the numbers, because the numbers have fallen uh, the last uh, years. Because of a lack of, 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 of European solutions. For example, when a refugee comes in, he asks asylum where? Always in the same countries, always in Greece, always in Italy, always in Spain. Uh, because, uh, and there is no solidarity inside European Union. There doesn't exist, for example, a European economic migration. So many of these refugees are not real refugees, or people looking for a better job. So normally there should be a channel in, through which they can go not to abuse uh, re, uh, the refugee status, not to abuse the asylum uh, status and uh, to go directly to Europe and say I'm ready to work uh, in Europe. Can I have a permit to do so? A European permit doesn't exist. It are 28 different systems. So our, it's, it's a clear example. The migration crisis is not because of Europe, it's because of a lack of Europe. Well, it is a, has been a crisis, however, in Europe. We've seen such a difference of opinion across the block, a exactly. failure to find a common policy. Uh, some predicting that this could be the beginning of, of splits, perhaps definitive splits of the European Union. Yeah, but the, the, it's a good example of where uh, a lack of European Union leads to, to more division, uh, more contradiction uh, between the north and the south, between the east and uh, 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 the west, and, and we have to fix it as fast as possible. You have to ask yourself why is it not possible that we have one common European migration uh, policy? Why is it not possible that we have uh, yeah, a new economic uh, governance structure for the euro, for example? Uh, to face the next financial crisis we will come. Why it is not possible to have one European defence community? Because it is still, this union, uh, a bunch of member states, of nation states, 27 in the future, uh, who act together based on the rule of unanimity. And in the world of tomorrow, to act on the rule of unanimity, you're always doing too little and certainly too late. All right, I think that's a debate for another time. Uh, <laughs>
I also want to talk about the European elections in 2019. They've been billed as the most important ever for the EU. Uh, now, your centrist alliance, ALDE, uh, has been somewhat in the focus, particularly in France. A big question about whether Emmanuel Macron will be bringing his La République en Marche movement to join ALDE. Uh, will it they will be doing not be so? a question of joining one or the other. That will not happen. What will happen is to build something new together because there is an absolute need, as Macron has already indicated, to have an alternative political force against the nationalist and the populist. And that alternative cannot be the old parties, cannot be the European People's Party, uh, who is dominated by Mr. Orban, cannot be the socialists and democrats who are uh, losing election after election and are so responsible for this European Union. To beat the nationalist and populist and to safeguard the European project, you need a new movement, a new alternative. And we are ready to work together with Emmanuel Macron to build up that uh, new movement. Uh, just one final question. Uh, turnout has been drastically falling in European elections. We've seen so much turmoil for Europe, people disinterested, disaffected with Europe. What's your prediction? Well, can it be a new start for I, Europe we can next stop. year? We can stop it, but you can only stop it if, first of all, you recognize the weaknesses of Europe. So not to do what the traditional parties are doing, the EPP and the Socialists and Democrats saying, yeah, you have to defend Europe even, and not to look to the weaknesses of Europe. So you have to recognize what goes wrong in the European Union, because nationalists and populists are not always wrong when they criticize the European Union. But then you have also to present a positive alternative, huge reforms, not weak measures, but huge reforms. And together with Macron, we hope to deliver that in 2019. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much, Guy Verhofstadt, for your time. Thank you for watching Talking Europe on France 24. We hope to see you again next time. Declared an autonomous state of Somalia in 1998, Puttland sits at the crossroads of major maritime routes. Pirates often raided ships carrying valuable cargo and held their crews for ransom. The European Union's armed forces have nearly put an end to these attacks. But the threat remains as various jihadi factions ratchet up the violence, endangering Puttland's fragile stability. Join me for Puntland Revisited all this week on France 24 and France24.com.